in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. 1 Samuel, chapter 17, starting with verse 34. The 34th verse of the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. And where are you going to find it? If I were you, I'd just stop right now, wherever I am, and look and tell us, Lee, like you're reading it, wherever I am. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine, that's Goliath, shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Both my text and my title is found in verse 39, that the last line or two, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. Our Heavenly Father, I realize that greater men than I have stood here this week, and I find it a little bit difficult and yet challenging to realize that these great men of God have stood behind this pulpit. And now we come to the last day of this conference, and I feel a responsibility far greater than I'm able to fulfill. And so, Holy Spirit, I cast myself upon you and pray that you would cast yourself upon me, that we together may be a blessing. I pray that thou who has convicted me when I was lost came to live and abide in me when I got saved, that thou who has led me and guided me and comforted me and taught me and strengthened me through these years and thank God in the, on occasion has filled me, I pray you'd fill me with thyself this morning. Accomplish something real. And I pray that you'd give, me a, give us a Curtis Hudson in this service. Something happened to some young preacher that happened in 1961 to this great man of God. Do something eternal and lasting in this hour, and may this be an hour to which many shall look and say, on that Friday morning in July 1983, it happened to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Philistines were an old and powerful enemy of Israel. Often they had invaded the land leaving the land in ruin and desolation. Now they come to another invasion, the Philistines invading the land of Israel. King Saul, the king of Israel, calls Israel to arms, and the two armies pitch their tents on either side of the valley of Eli, Elah. On the north side of the valley of Elah was camped the Philistine army, and on the south side of the valley was camped the armies of Israel, when suddenly a giant appeared before the armies, whose name was Goliath. I think about nine feet, nine inches tall, anyway, anyway he was somewhere near ten feet tall. Goliath issues a challenge to the armies of Israel, and you know it as well as I know it. He suggests that they choose a captain, and that captain fight for Israel, and uh, Goliath would represent the Philistines. Now, if the captain of Israel wins the battle, 
then the victory in the warfare will go to Israel. But if Goliath wins the fight with the captain of Israel, then the victory in the warfare will go to uh, the Philistines. For 40 days, he spoke terror to the people of God. Back home was a little lad named David. His father said to David, Son, your brethren are fighting in the war against the Philistines. I want you to take a little package of food, like so much like a, we'd have a care package today. Take a little package of food to my, to my sons, your brothers, and uh, take some corn, and take some cheese, and take some loaves of bread. So little David goes to battlefront, and he hears Goliath as Goliath is breathing out these threatenings against the people of God. Now I'm going to ad-lib just a little bit and tell you what I think David would have said in our language. I think David said to his brothers, What's that big blowhard saying? And his brothers said he's a captain, or uh, uh, presented himself as a captain of the Philistines. And he's recommending uh, an individual confrontation with a captain chosen by Israel. And David said, oh, I don't know, some of you guys, one of you guys go knock his block off. Now, I'm talking in the, in the, in the Hebrew because I'm a college chancellor, and uh, I, uh, I want you to know scholarship when you hear it. And David said, in the Hebrew, he said, why don't somebody go knock his block off? And uh, his brother Eliab said, now look, sonny boy, a warfare is a place for men, not a place for boys. Now, you un unload the cheese and the crackers and the, uh, the bread and the corn, and you get on back there. You've got a few sheep to take care of, but this is no place for little boys. But David said, and he said, well, <laughs> uh, Eliab, I understand that, but none of you men is standing forth to fight Goliath. Why don't you go take care of the situation? And if you don't, I think I can. So, uh, and he said, look, he said, uh, uh, son, you can't do that. And David said, look at me. He said, you see these hands right here? Why, he said, I took those hands and I killed a bear with those hands. A lion and a bear came and tried to get one of my sheep. And I took these hands and I killed a bear. And I took these hands and I killed a lion. I'll bet you if I could kill a bear with these hands and kill a lion, I'll buy and you one thing. I could take care of that uncircumcised Philistine like I took care of the lion and the bear. Eliab said, well, let's go talk to the king about that. And they come to King Saul. Now, King Saul's the fellow should have been out there fighting Goliath. The Bible said he was head and shoulders above all the people, which means he was this much taller than the second tallest man in Israel. He's the guy that should have been out there. And so King little David walks up and says to King Saul, I think I can take care of the situation. If you want somebody to handle that big buzzard out there, once again going into the original language. And uh, <laughs> so Saul said, now look, son, this is a place for men. But David said, let me tell you what I did. And Saul said, what did you do? And David said, I had a lion came out and tried to get one of my little lambs. And I had a bear came out and tried to get one of my little lambs. And he said, I took these hands, and I killed the lion, and I killed the bear. And uh, I bet you I could take care of, of, of that big uh, loudmouth out there that's making popping off so much. And King Saul said, you killed a lion? Yes, sir. You killed a bear? Yes, sir. He said, then, okay, I'll let you do it. Now, he said, however, I want to help you. Well, that's mighty gracious of the old fella. I want to help you. He said, I've got my armor here, and I'll let you have my armor. Now, the armor was both defensive and offensive. The armor of the Christian, for example, in Ephesians chapter 6, includes the shield, also includes the sword. And uh, so he said, you take my armor. So King David gets inside of Saul's armor. Uh, David wore a 34 short. Once again, going into the original language. And Saul wore a 54 extra long. And David gets in that little 34 body in that 54 uh, armor. I'm not going to tell you how big it was, but David walked a half a block and the armor didn't move a bit. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> David, <laughs> he looks up through that armor and, and he says, He says, Your Highness, I don't mean to be unkind and I don't mean to be disrespectful. But he said, uh, uh, he, he said, This armor, it may be good. And I maybe could kill Goliath with, with your armor, but I don't know that it could. You see, Your Highness, I never killed a bear with this armor, but I did kill a bear with these hands. I never killed a lion with this armor I got on, but I did kill a lion with these hands. 
I've got a little slingshot. You get me a few stones. I know that'll work. Now, I don't know this will work. It may work. I might could do it. I might not could do it. But there's one thing I do know. I know these hands will work. And I know my slingshot will work. He said, I know that for sure. And then he gave our text. He said, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. Ladies and gentlemen and friends of the sword of the Lord, and in some cases they may be both the same. But the great problem we face in America today is we're experimenting too much on things we have not yet proved will work and not using the things that we know will work, that we have proved and tested on the battlegrounds that they'll prove and they'll work. We don't have to have... Now, it just may be, for example, that Mr. Spock's uh, book may, may be good. Uh, I use Mr. Spock's book in the rearing of our kids. I did. I, it makes a good paddle. I used it to spank the kids with. And uh, now it just may be that 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 be okay. But we don't know that's okay. But we do know that we reared the greatest country on the face of the earth using God's method in rearing our children. I do not know but what maybe if we disarm, Russia may disarm. Somehow I have a little suspicion about it. But, but uh, it just may be if we disarm that Russia may disarm. And it just may be that these pinks and leftists and fondas and all the rest of them, it just may be they may be right that if we would unilaterally disarm, Russia would do it. Or have a nuclear freeze, Russia would have a nuclear freeze. It may work. It just may work. But we don't know it worked. But we do know that America built the biggest army and air force and navy on the face of the earth. And we do know that that worked. Now, in our churches, it's the same way. It's the same way. We're, we're, look, we've we got too much new stuff we're trying out. I, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. We've got too many seminars and workshops and, and, uh, and religious emphases week. We need to get back to old hell raising preaching. We know that'll work. We know that'll work. Now, you listen to me. I'm here today. Look, look, I know, I know. Look at this. Look at this carpet. Man alive. Look at it. I mean, look at Brother Hudson. And his, uh, his, his suit and tie match. And... Uh, and, 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 uh, look, look, look at that. I better use somebody else here. I know. <laughs> you know, I, I just don't see any need to have something new when something old is doing the job. For example, I, uh, if you looked at the back of my shirt this morning, uh, I wear one kind of shirt. That's all. Arrow, Kent, Kirk. Uh, the difference in the Kent and the Kirk, one has 80% polyester, 20% wool, the other has 65% polyester, and 35% wool. That's all I wear. Now, you give me a Van Heusen shirt, I won't wear it. Just no way. You give me an in row, I won't wear it. Well, you say, preacher, you might like it better than an Arab Kirk Kent. Yeah, I may, but I may not. But I know I like an Arab Kirk Kent. And I, I, I guess I own, I don't know how many shirts I own, 35, 40. They're all Arab Kirk Kent. Now, I've got shirts that my kids have given me for Father's Day. I've never worn, never will wear them. I give them the rescue mission, and uh, yeah, I, I just won't wear them. Well, you say, preacher, you ought to try something. I don't want anything. You will like what I got. I am. Um, I wear, I wear, I don't wear an undershirt. I, I wear a T-shirt. I don't like that stuff trickling down my side while I preach. And <laughs> so... I wear a jockey T-shirt. Always do. I guess I own 50 of them. Jockey T-shirt. A large size. I Look, my birthday is the month after next. I'm giving you a shopping list here now. I wear large size 42 to 44 jockey T-shirt. That's all I wear. You give me a Hanes T-shirt, I won't wear it. I've got a drawer full of them my kids have given me because they couldn't find my size in a jockey T-shirt. I won't wear them. But you say for the house, I like a Hanes. Then you wear a Hanes, but keep your nose out of my T-shirt. I'll wear what I want to wear. You see, I found what I like. Now, I may like the Hanes better. I may like the, uh, something else better. But I know I've proved the jockey T-shirt. I, uh, I use same kind of deodorant. I've used same kind for 20 years. I use fresh cream deodorant. I was hoping a while ago Dr. Hudson would start using fresh cream deodorant. But I use... I use fresh cream deodorant. <laughs> now... Uh, you buy me Ice Blue Secret, I won't touch it. 
I won't use right guard. I won't use mom. I won't use Eric. I use fresh cream deodorant. Now you some of the house. Why don't you try something else? You might like it. I might, and I might not. But no, I like fresh cream deodorant. I am. Um, uh, I use men in talcum. I, I, I have a heavy beard, and I always put talcum uh, uh, after shave talcum. That's all I ever used. I use a Ronson razor. Uh, years ago, I, I got uh, acquainted with a Ronson electric razor. And I, it's all I've used now for 25 years or so, Ronson electric razor. Now, they don't make them anymore, but I found out they're going to quit making them and bought me a dozen of them before they quit. And I've got a lifetime supply all set, set at home. That's all I ever used. Now, you buy me an Norelco, I won't touch it. You say, preacher, you'd like it better. I may like it better, and I may not like it better. And since I don't know whether I would or not, and I know I like the Ronson, you keep your nose out of my shaving. I use Dr. Scholl's foot powder. I use consort hairspray. I thank God, I thank God that I was born in the dispensation of hairspray. I, uh, <laughs> I have... One place that every little hair has got to be here. I'm in serious trouble. I'm in serious trouble anyhow. So I just, I just put it there and spray it quickly. And, uh, and, and really, the truth is, I've got twice as many hairs up there as I have roots. I've got hairs that fell out years ago that are stuck to hairs that are still there. Now, what I'm saying is this. I know what I want. I know what I've proved. I know what I like. Now, we fundamentalists, uh, we, we're experimenting too much. We got, uh, we got too much new that's coming in, taking the place of the old. Years ago, when I was a kid preacher, I went to college and I couldn't find a place to preach. So I'd go out in the country. I had a car, a 1941 Dodge. I called it Jezebel because it didn't run very well. And I got Jezebel and, <laughs> and drove her out in the country and... Uh, and I'd, 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 I'd drive, and I'd get me a barn, rent a barn, or, or, or borrow a barn for, for an afternoon. <laughs> and I'd, I'd go up and down the country roads, and I'd say, look, I'm preaching up here in a couple hours. I'm not going to take an offering. I'm just going to preach. Come and hear me. I was driving down the road one day, way out about ten miles south of Marshall, Texas, where I went to college. I came on a white church building frame, the old country church. You have hundreds of them down here in Tennessee. And it was called, of all things, the St. Mary's Baptist Church. I can't believe it. I couldn't believe it. St. Mary's Baptist Church. Well, I, I got out of the car and, <laughs> and, uh, and said, hello, hello. Now, I'm not being disrespectful to colored people. I, I baptize colored folks every Sunday. And I have no... Oh, we have one or two loud mouths. I wish I could get rid of But, but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, but it, this is the way uh, that it, they talk. Uh, he said, uh, the colored fellow came out, and he said, yes, sir. He said, may I help you, please? And I said, my name is Jack Hyam. <laughs> I said, are you the pastor here? He said, no, sir. He said, my, my name is Deacon Bussey, B-U-S-S-E-Y, Deacon Bussey. And I said, Deacon Bussey, uh, do you have preaching here every Sunday? Yes, sir, uh, he said. The, the, the Lord's Day, uh, Reverend Roseburg from the Bishop College, a Christian college for black students, uh, Reverend Roseburg comes every Lord's Day and preaches for us on the Lord's Day. I said, do you have church on Wednesday night? And he said, no, sir. I said, Reverend Roseburg teaches at the Bishop College on Wednesday night, and we don't have no services yet except on the Lord's Day. And I said, Deacon Bussey, if I'd come out here every Wednesday night and preach for you, would you get the folks and round them up? And he said, yes, sir, we sure would. He said, what would it cost? I said, exactly what it's worth. It won't cost you a thing. And so, <laughs> every Wednesday night, for months and months and m- months and months, several years, I went out to the St. Mary's Baptist Church out in the country, and uh, 10 miles south of Marshall, Texas, off the Carthage Highway. We stayed to about 11.15 to 11.30 every Wednesday night, and they had kerosene lamps and lanterns. So they didn't like the lamp, lamps and lanterns until I got there. So I'd, get, I'd walk, get park out in the parking lot, and the pulpit's up here. I'd walk in. Couldn't see a thing. They were facing the pulpit, and I was behind them. And it was dark inside, and they were dark outside. And so I couldn't see a thing. I'd say, hello. They'd all turn around. I'd count the eyes, divide by two, and that's what the crowd was that night. Looked like headlights, you know, uh, uh, as I am. Now, I'd start preaching about 8 o'clock. I'd preach an hour, hour and a half, two hours, just like I planned to today. And uh, I'd preach a couple hours, and, and I, listen, you never saw anything like it in your life. 
I'd preach about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, the women always sat on this side, and the men sat on this side, the center aisle down here. And Deacon Busty sat on the back row. Well, he would start to go about, about 45 minutes into my sermon. He'd start swaying from side to side like that. Then his eyes would grow while he would sway. And then he'd stand up. And then the, the whole row beside him uh, would, would start swaying and eyes rolling. And they would stand up. Now, I'm still preaching. And the men on, all the men on this side would stand up and start swaying from side to side and eyes rolling. And then Deacon Bussey, as if taken by some strange unseen force, would come out to the center aisle. And the fellow behind him would put his hands on Deacon Bussey's waist. And the fellow behind him would put his hands on the fellow's waist in front of him till all the men were lined up around that little section of pews. Uh, I've never seen a conga line, but it must be about what a conga line would be. And they would, and, and then Mrs. Bussey on this side, back row, would start swaying. And she'd uh, eyes roll. Now, I've never, I don't know if I've ever done a real shouting or not, but I'll guarantee if the eyes don't roll, it's counterfeit. I'll tell you that for sure. And uh, so, the ladies on this side. Now, I'd be preaching all the time, and then they'd start singing, What could I do without the Lord? And walking around and swaying from side to side, and eyes rolling, go up and down the aisle singing, What could I do without the Lord? What could I do without the Lord? I hate to admit this, but many a, many a Wednesday night, at midnight, Dr. Jack Hiles, pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, chancellor of Hiles Anderson College, had my hand, had his hands on the waist of the old black fellow in front of him, I'd be going around the pews, side to side, rolling my eyes, singing, What could I do without the Lord? You know what? That got in my bones. I, I found what I wanted. You see, don't talk to me about church anthems. I already found what I want. Don't talk to me about the sevenfold amen. I've already found what I want. Don't talk to me about the glory of Patre. I've found what I want. Now, I, it just may be that you can build a great church on, on, on anthems and glory of Patre and sevenfold amen. And the Lord is in His holy temple to all earth. Keep silent before Him. Amen, 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 amen. It just may be you can do it. But I don't know you can. But bless God, I know what you can do on old-fashioned hell-raising preaching. I know what you can do on that. Now, you listen to me. You listen to me. There ought not to ever be a Baptist meeting without old-fashioned hellfire and brimstone preaching. Now, it just may be other things will work, but we don't know they will. It just may be that having cantatas in a place of preaching might work. But I don't know it will, so I've never done it. It just may be pulling the pulpit off and having a drama on a, a, a club on a Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night. It just may be having a play. It might work. I don't know. It may or it may not. But I know what preaching will do. And I, listen, boy, there's nothing in this world that takes the place of old-fashioned preaching. And that's why you've enjoyed this week. Yeah, I've had a bunch of committee meetings and a group of the unprepared, unqualified, do the unnecessary, who spend the week reading the minutes and wasting the hours. You're not concerned about that. Listen, we fundamentalists cut our teeth on preaching. We built our churches on preaching. David said, Your Highness, I don't know about this armor. It's mighty nice. It's mighty shiny. And I'm sure, Your Highness, you've won some great battles. But I never killed a lion with this armor. I never killed a bear with this armor. But these hands killed a lion, and these hands killed a bear. And I got a little slingshot that's pretty good. And I'll tell you, I know those things have been proved. And ladies and gentlemen, we fundamental people don't need to borrow from the Episcopalian workshop. We don't need to borrow from the Presbyterian uh, uh, meeting. We don't need to borrow from somebody else's convention. We built the greatest churches on the face of this earth on old-fashioned window rattling, shingle pulling, barn storming, hell raising, hell fire and brimstone preaching. And if we have a right to exist, we'll exist on that that has been proved in the field of battle. Now, you listen to me. My daddy, my daddy was an unsaved man. My daddy went to church one time with me in his life. I was seven years of age. We sat back in the back. Came time for the preaching. 
My heart began to beat faster because my preacher was going to preach for the only time in my daddy's life or in his life to my daddy. And my pastor got up when I was a seven-year-old boy, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, he said, tonight is the night of our annual musical choir cantata. And I love music. And I love drama. And I love plays. But I hope if you people pull the pulpit out and on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, you substitute music for preaching, or Sunday night at 7 o'clock, you substitute music for preaching, or drama for preaching, hope the whole choir gets the hiccups and can't sing. My pastor said, this is our annual cantata, and the only time that my daddy ever sat in church in his life, beside his son and his wife and his daughter, they had a Christmas a musical cantata, and he went to sleep. And I went home that night and got on my knees beside my little bed, and I said, dear God, that wasn't right tonight. My daddy was lost. My daddy needed to hear some preaching. That wasn't right. And I said, dear God, if you ever make me a preacher... I promise you when preaching time comes, preaching time has come. I promise you that. And I've been pastoring, preaching now for over 37 years. Every Sunday morning of those 37 years, it's been the book. And every Sunday night, it's been the book. And every Wednesday night, it's been the book. And nothing will take the place of what we've tested and tried in the battlefield of the spiritual warfare. When I was a little fellow... You won't believe this. You folks never heard me before. When I was a little fella, I was very timid and shy. And by the way, I still am privately. I, I'm, in some ways, I, I'm very shy. I sat on the pool, well, in the chair a while ago on the platform. And I said, dear Lord, there's a, there's a certain way I'm supposed to preach. I've got sort of an image around the country as being a certain kind of preacher. But I don't feel like I can do it again today. And, uh, and I feel it every time. But every time I walk from right there to right there, something turns on. It's a snap. It's a switch. It turns on. When I was a kid, though, it never turned on. I was introvert, front public speaking. Weighed 92 pounds on my 17th birthday. Didn't have a date till I was 17 because I couldn't reach anybody but the beginners in primaries, and their parents were all too strict. I never said anything. Never made a speech at church, never talked to anybody, hardly ever even said hello. I was the quietest per person in the church, and the int they called me Little Jackie Boy. I was 17 years old, they still called me Little Jackie Boy. When I was 17 years of age, I was standing after the morning service, back at the back door, about right back here, on Sunday morning. Jesse Cobb, the chairman of our deacon board, a fellow who was a manager of a Ben Franklin Department Store, and about five foot five inches tall, a little short fellow. He came back and he said, Jack, I said, and he said, Jack, what are you going to do this afternoon? <laughs> and I said, I'm going home. He said, why don't you go soul winning with me? And I said, Jesse, you, 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 you know me. You, 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 you've known me for ye years. I, I, I couldn't go soul winning. He said, now, Jack, I don't need you to talk. I just need you to, to go with me and listen and be with me. Well, I had a Ph.D. in listening. And uh, he said, my partner, Carrie Plexico, is on vacation. I haven't got nobody to go with me. I want, I want some moral support. He said, now, I, I said, did, would, 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 did, did, would, would I have to say anything? He said, you would have to say hello or hi. And I said, I'll go. That afternoon, Jesse Cobb, five foot five inches tall, and I was shorter and smaller than he, we went out soul winning. When the first door we knocked on was the door of a, of a big tackle on the W.H. Adamson High School football team named Kenneth Florence. Kenneth came to the door, looked down at Jesse, down at me, and Jesse said, Kenneth, my name, my name is Jesse Cobb. I'm glad to meet you. He said, this is Jack Hyatt. I generated all the extra version at my disposal, and I said, <laughs> and Jesse said, Kenneth, <laughs> Jack here wants to say a few words to you. No, Jack didn't either. No, Jack didn't. 
Now, I don't know what I said. Jesse told me what I said. <laughs> Jesse said, I said, K -k 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 Kenneth, w w w w w would, you would you like to c come to church tonight? And Jesse said, Kenneth said, yes, I would. And Jesse said, I said, you would. <laughs> and Jesse said, Kenneth said, yes, I would. <laughs> and Jesse said, I said, I I I'll come by and get, get you at 7. That night, 7 o'clock, went by Jesse, uh, Kenneth Florence's house. Just myself. Ken Florence. Drove him to church. We sat on the second row from the back. I knew for the first time in my life that God had given me a soul I had to win. I didn't know the plan of salvation enough to tell it. I didn't know enough Scripture to help him. But I knew, I knew that God had given Kenneth Florence I'd never won a soul to Christ in my life. Invitation time came. I put my arms around his big broad shoulders and I said, Kenneth, wouldn't you like to be saved? He said, I sure would. I said, follow me. We walked down that aisle right there. Had a center section like this, like this. Walked down that aisle right there. My pastor, Brother Sizemore, met me right there. And he said, what can I do for you, Jackie boy? <laughs> and I said, Pastor, <laughs> this is Kenneth Ken Florence. He, 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 he wants to be saved. And turned to walk back. And the pastor said, hold it, Jack. Hold it. Come back here. He said, Kenneth, Jack wants to kneel here at the altar and tell you how to be saved. He was as big a liar as Jesse Cobb was. <laughs> I knelt right there in the center of the building on that front pew, and, and Kenneth Florence beside me. And I said, Kenneth, I don't know how to do this. But I, I, he said, Jack, I know how to be saved. Folks have been trying to get me saved for a long time. I just needed somebody that cared for me. That's all. I know what to do. And I, listen, I knelt there, a little 92-pound runt, introvert, flunk public speaking, in a high school, never had a date. Nobody took me seriously. And I heard that young football player say, Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save my soul. I do now receive Jesus as my Savior. Woo! I tell you, the fireworks of heaven turned loose in my soul. I mean, the Roman candles started shooting toward the sky, and the fireworks began to go off, and the light, uh, the, the uh, firecrackers popped, and the sparkles Sparkle, and all of a sudden I was consumed. And while he was praying, I said, here's something little Jackie boy can do. I said, that young man was on his way to hell to burn in the fires of hell forever and ever and ever. And now he's saved. His name is written in heaven. He's redeemed. His sins are forgiven. He's God's child. He's not going to go to hell. And I was consumed. I jumped up off my knees and ran to my pastor and said, Brother Sizemore, would it be okay with you if I just did this all the time from now on. You can, you can check the records. You can check the records of Fernwood Baptist Church. I brought in the next seven days, I brought 37 converts down the aisle in the Fernwood Baptist Church. And ladies and gentlemen, I found what I wanted. Now, it just may be that you can build a church on religious emphases week. It just may be. <laughs> but I, what I know, I know soul winning will work. I tried it in the Morris Chapel Baptist Church to go to Texas with 19 members. I tried it in the Grange Hall Baptist Church out in the country, outside of Marshall, Texas, with 37 members to start with. I tried it at the Southside Baptist Church in Henderson, Texas. I tried it at the Miller Road Baptist Church of Garland, Texas. And for almost 24 blessed years, I've tried it at the First Baptist Church of Hammond. And ladies and gentlemen, I do not know if these modern newfangled ideas will work. I don't know. They may, they may not. But blessed be God, I know what you can do with personal soul winning. I know. You know, back yonder many years ago, Lee Robertson, John Rice, Jack Hiles, a few of us went up and down this country every week. Saying, let's go soul winning. You know what I'm... You've done it too these years. Let's go soul winning. Let's go soul winning. Let's go soul winning. Let's go soul winning. We built the greatest churches on the face of this earth. No generation has ever seen the mighty, great, soul winning churches were built in this land. This church right here is one of them. And yet, when we got up to a certain size, we got impressed with ourselves. You know, we've gotten too much away from just knocking on doors. I'm not going to be unkind. I'm not going to be mean. I'm not going to call in names. I have no tabloids. I'll tell you something. Most of us preachers would be a lot better off 
If we take about 75% of the time, we're spending trying to get Joe Doe elected dog catcher and go soul winning at that time. I'll tell you something else, too. There are preachers here who built your churches on soul winning. And then you started schools, and your schools have sapped your soul winning. And I want to say this. I, I'm going to say it. Hair lips every dog in this county. Listen to me. If I had to choose today between the soul winning program of First Baptist Church Hammond and close the school or keep the school open and dampen the soul winning, I'd close the doors of Hiles Anderson College. I'd close the doors of Hammond Baptist High School. I'd close the doors of City Baptist High School. I'd close the doors of Hammond Baptist Junior High School. I'd close the doors of Hammond Baptist Grade School. I'd close the doors of Hammond Baptist Senior Grade School. Listen, we had better get back to the doorstep. We know that'll work. We know it'll work. My mama, my mama took her Bible every night when I was a boy. As far back as I can remember, till I went in the Army as a paratrooper in World War II. She took that Bible that I have in my study tonight, today. Almost 60 years, about 60 years old the Bible is. My mama took that Bible every night. And I won't go into it because most of you heard it, but she said, Son, this is the Bible, and the Bible's the Word of God. She said, Say it, Son. And I said, Mama, the Bible is the Word of God. Say it again. The Bible is the Word of God. Say it again. The Bible is the Word of God. And then my mama would read out of that Bible to me 30 minutes a night. You say, Did you enjoy it? Not a second of it. I hated it. I dreaded it. About four o'clock in the afternoon, that Bible cloud started coming up. And I hated to see it come. <clears throat> but now I, I treasure those minutes and those nights. My mother's 95 years of age now. And I treasure the memories I have of my mama reading that Bible. The other day, the other day, I picked the Bible up that Mama reared me on. I began to thumb through it, and I saw its tear stains, and I saw its markings. And I saw some flowers from the grave of Mama's two little girls that died each when they were seven. I looked in the front of the Bible and noticed it said, Authorized King James Version. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, in, in, I'm not in slander suits, and I'm not going to give you any, any, any uh, fodder for slander. I have no tabloids, and I'm not going to try to, 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 to get in any kind of a warfare battle. I'm just simply saying, regardless of what you think about the King James movement, it, it, we, we did pretty good with it a long time. It did us good service. For 37 years I've been preaching. Last, last December I preached my 40,000th sermon. All of them been, been preached with the same Bible. Moody did pretty well with it. Of course, he could have done better, I'm sure, if he'd had a revised version or, or uh, American Standard, but, but or, 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 or Good Speed or Bad Speed or uh, Moffitt or a Prophet, uh, he, he'd done better. But did pretty good. Did his Sunday. Was handicapped somewhat, but did pretty well. You see, the reason I don't belong to the Bible a Month Club is I just found what I wanted. <laughs> I don't need anything else. Just found what I wanted. And yet, there it says, there it says on your coffee table. Yeah. I mean, there's the eternal, never dying Word of God on your coffee table. Somebody said, boy, that Bible was written before the foundation of the world. That Bible was never written. It always was. That Bible is just as eternal as is Jehovah God. That Bible is just as eternal as is the Lord Jesus Christ. That Bible is just as eternal as is the Holy Ghost. Always, there never was a time when there was no Word of God. And there is God's revealed eternal Word sitting on your coffee table while you watch the edge of night. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't understand it. I just can't figure it out. I don't, you say you're saved, and yet you watch mash and squash and all in the family, and, and uh, edge of night and the corner of darkness, uh, darkness and secret storm and silent tornado and tiptoe and hurricane and love boat and all that garbage, when there it sets the eternal, never dying Word of God sets on the... Listen, ladies and gentlemen, hey, look, I have, never, I have never in my life 
I don't know what these other things do, but I know what this book will do. I know what it will do. I know what this book will do in the lives of boys and girls if you feed it to them. I know what this book will do in the lives of church members if you feed it to them. I know what this book will do in the life of a preacher if you feed upon it. I know what it will do. King David said, little David said, Your Highness, I don't mean to do in disrespect, unkindness to you. I, I think your armor is real nice. It's not my size, but it's real nice. And I, I think a knight could lick the lies with it, but don't know it could. Because I never killed a bear with this armor. I never killed a lion with this armor. Listen, don't take pictures while I'm preaching. You hear me. We'll go Kodak in after a while. He said, I don't know what this armor is. How I, I, I can do. But I know one thing. I have tested and tried these hands. I have tested and tried this leg. And ladies and gentlemen, for 37 years, I've tested and tried this book. You know what? we got too many... We're listening to too many Christian radio programs. I mean, we're, we're spending too much time listening to Christian radio stations, if there is such a thing. Or Christian TV, if there is such a thing. We're reading too much about the book and not enough of the book. We're reading too many daily devotional books and not enough daily manna books. The book. I mean, but you say, preacher, I can't understand the Bible. Don't, don't, don't. First place, I wouldn't want a book that I could understand. But brother, the person that wrote it abides in here. This is where he lives. That's where he lives. First place, you can understand the book. Let me just let it open here. And it says, He went into the house. <laughs> What's well, a tough one, ain't it? Wonder what that means. <laughs> you sorry fake. You head fundamentalist in the heart liberal. You say you can't understand the book. Get it down! Read, 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 read! Memorize it, memorize it, memorize it! Preach it, preach it, preach it! Teach it, teach it! It's been proved. It's been proved. Let me exegete that verse for you. He is the opposite of the sheep. Went means he ain't here no more. In two means he ain't outside. The means it wasn't but one. House where folks live. When I was a boy, Brother Smith, when I was a boy, my pastor would stand up and he'd say, let's sing together without the piano. And it, it would sing, we didn't care the tune always right. We'd sing, come thy fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. And my pastor tears rolled down his cheeks. No sister Johnson to come unscrewed and start to shout. And, uh, <laughs> and we'd sing, we'd sing, Majestic sweetness sits enthroned upon the Savior's brow. Think about it. Majestic sweetness sits enthroned as a king upon the Savior's brow. We'd sing, Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. We'd sing, um, There's a fountain filled with blood. You know, I found what I wanted. These are the house. <laughs> you like uh, you like these little these little, little ditties. You the old hound dog had manes, and I talked with God and prayed, and God healed his manes, and I'm going to heaven someday. <laughs> dust on the Bible, dust on God's holy word. I seen the wreck on the highway, cause I didn't hear nobody pray. Boy, a little of that goes a long ways for me. I found what I wanted. Hey. And if you haven't got one, nobody's 
You choose the songs in there have been won, have tested on the battlefield. You find out what Mr. Sankey sang and sing it. You find out what Mr. Roadheaver sang. You find out what kind of songs brought, led and bring the great revivals of Billy Sunday and Dwight Moody. You find out what Lee Robertson is used in building the great, uh, ten, uh, what is the name of that church? Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Hey, these little second-rate ditties, we don't need them. We have something that's tested and proved in the field of battle. David said, Your Highness, I'm not sure about this armor stuff. I think it's awful nice and awful pretty, but I never have used it before. But I'll tell you what I do know. I know these hands could kill a bear. I know these hands could kill a lion. And I'll bet they could take care of their uncircumcised Philistine, too. I went to college. I always have to announce that. I went to college. It's a kid preacher. Left Dallas, Texas to go to Marshall, Texas. No car. On a bus. Had $40, a wife and a black cat. After we had spent the $40 and eaten the back black cat, there's nobody but us. I enrolled at East Texas Baptist College without one dime. Paid thirty-seven fifty of that forty dollars for an apartment, two dollars and fifty cents worth of groceries, and that was it. I got up, went up, went up on on in the afternoon, <coughs> the summer school session. My preacher had showed me a scripture. It showed me the great Jeremiah thirty-three three. Call on me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. And I went up on the courthouse square, the courthouse in Marshall, Texas. And I got on my knees, Harrison County Courthouse. I looked up to God and I said, Dear God, I've got to have a job. I said, Dear God, <laughs> my man, on Jeremiah 33 3, I'd claim a job. I looked, I looked down at uh, Washington Street and saw the J.C. Penney store. And I said, Dear Lord, give me a job there. I took my Bible, walked down the street, walked the street, about two or three blocks to the J.C. Penney store, Bible open to Jeremiah 33, 3, walked in the store, Bible open just like that. One of those old-fashioned, loose-leaf, Schofield Bibles walked in. I asked a little lady, I said, where's the manager? She said, Mr. Croft is manager, I'll call him. He came to see me, big, fat, white-haired fellow. He walked up and said, what can I do for you, young, you, you young man? And I said, sir, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I think I'm going to work here. He said, he said, young man, we just fired four men because of the summer slump. What right do you think you have to think you're going to go to work? He just fired four good men. And I said, look at there. My preacher told me that verse, and he said, I go through college on that. I said, Jeremiah 33, 3, he says, call me, I'll answer thee, and show thee great mighty things I know it's not. He looked at me, and he squared, squared his jaw, and he said, you're hired. And then he said, Something I'll never forget. He said, young man, he said, you'll either be the best salesman in the history of this store or the biggest flop in the history of Harrison County. And I'd die of curiosity if I didn't find out which. <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. <clears throat> Don't you get the idea that those of us who pastored for years and God has given great churches, don't you get the idea those churches are built on a few funny stories? I say this, and this is true, and God in heaven, here's what I say, and every member of First Baptist Church know this is true. Every step we've taken at First Baptist Church, Hammond's been on our knees. I found out it worked. I mean, delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Call unto me, and I'll answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will, it shall be given you. It works. I'm simply saying, listen, back to the prayer closet, back to the doorstep, back to the book, and back to preaching. Listen, we've got too much newfangled stuff coming. We've got too many books on how to overcome depression. Seventy-five ways on how to overcome melancholy. I can tell you one word, lick it all. One word, O-T-H-E-R-S, others.
many years ago. I was called to pastor the little country church three miles outside of Bogota, Texas. Bogota was a town of a hundred or three thousand people. No, twelve hundred people. Morris Chapel Baptist Church out in the country. Nineteen members. Only one had a telephone. He was deaf and couldn't hear it ring. We had uh, one lady who could play the piano. She could only play one song. That's the Old Rugged Cross. Everything we sang was to the tune of the Old Rugged Cross. I mean that. Had a pop that had wood stove right here in front of the pulpit. We'd go up on Sunday morning early and build a fire in the wintertime. The old pop that had stove and the yellow jackets would come out. And we'd get up and try to chase the yellow jackets out. Had one family had a Model A Ford and nobody else had a car. Came on by, by horseback and wagon and tractors. I made $7.50 a week just a few months ago, Dr. Jenny, a couple of those members of many years ago came to visit First Baptist Church of Hammond. I was so proud to show them all. <laughs> as country as okra and just as good you don't like okra, you're going to go straight to hell. No way. <laughs> Fried okra is what was dropped every morning for 40 years in the wilderness. And you can't argue with me. I know the original language. <laughs> Brother Dr. Jenny, they sat in our big auditorium. We had over 26,000 in Sunday school that morning. My mind wandered back that little wood stove. To Mrs. Charlie Smith, who played the piano, and Deacon Wood Armstrong, that led to singing with overalls, and old Rusty Bell out in the front. When it was all over, those two people that came to visit walked out, and they took my hand and said, Preacher, it's still the same thing, just more of it just more of it. I'm talking to hundreds of people in this room. You're trying too much. It's new. You've gotten away from that. those things. Test it! How much of this Bible have you read in the last 24 hours? I don't care how many conferences you attend. I don't care how many good books you buy or how many preacher signature you get in your Bible. Get back to the book. It's been tested. How long has it been since you spent five minutes with God? How long has it been since you saw the sun rise in the morning and you on your face before God saying, God, I've got to have your help? How long has it been since you went out like you used to and knocked on doors? A lot of you ought to get back to the old bus route you used to have. You've traded in a bunch of things tested in battle for somebody else's armor. And you don't know if it's going to work or not. Your Highness, said the little shepherd boy, I respect you. And by the way, that's the same Highness and King that tried to kill David. And that's the same body of the same King over which David stood one morning while the King was asleep with his sword pulled and could have taken the life of the King who was trying to take David's life at that very time. He said, You're, and, and it's the same one again, about whom David said, I would not lift up my hand against God's anointed. He said, I respect you as the king, and I respect your armor, and it may be all right. But he said, Your Highness, there's a giant out there. He's going to destroy us unless somebody can get him. And I don't know about this armor, but I know one thing. I know what I can do and what I have done with these hands. I took up my these hands and killed a lion. I took these hands and killed a bear. And I took the sling. said, Your Highness, if you don't mind, could I swap this? armor in for five smooth stones. I know how to handle those. I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. Our Heavenly Father, oh my God in heaven, how we need to get back to what's been tested. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. God, get us back to the things been tested and proved. 